Good morning, everyone. This is Olga Shared Antinanko. I'm so happy that you found some time to join us today. And we have a wonderful webinar with Sonia and Liam on fungal anatomy. Perfect topic, perfect season for it. And uh, welcome, Sonia. Thank you yeah. for having us. Um, yep, Liam and I are on Amanita Acres in Mason, Wisconsin, uh, right, tucked right up under Lake Superior. And right now, morel season is just about a week away, <laughs> so that's exciting. Um, except I will be at the conference for morel season. <laughs> that's okay. Hopefully, we'll find some down there. That'll be fun. Um, and today, we're going to be talking about fungal anatomy for identification purposes. So, this is something that you're going to get in the front of most decent field guides. They're going to give you a real quick uh, anatomy lesson on at least the cap and stem mushrooms. So you'll be able to find um, a lot of the vocabulary in there. And I do recommend always having a good field guide. Please do not rely on online groups or anything like that for your identification. You really want to get comfy with um, a few field guides. We have a few, don't we? We have like three or four field guides that we really like to use all for different purposes. Um, so what I would like to do in the next little while here is just kind of fill your toolbox on what it is that you're looking for, because it's one thing to see it on these drawings, like the decurrent and attached and all that, but it's another thing to actually see it in an, on an actual mushroom. So um, I won't spend a whole lot of time getting into specific gill types. What I'm going to do is more uh, give you an overview of where on the mushroom you should be looking for these things so that you can identify things safely. Um, if we remember from my life cycle lecture, the actual mushroom that you're picking is just the fruiting body of the organism. So picking one respectfully um, isn't going to really hurt the mycelium, right? Because what happens to the mycelium? It, it like it helps the mushroom. It grows right back, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep, it grows right back. Um, so for the most part, if you're being respectful in your harvesting, you should be okay just taking one for identification purposes. Um, okay, so here is an example of spore prints. Spore prints. We really like spore prints. Um, I kind of set this, uh, set this lecture up uh, in reverse so that at the end, you'll get the most like um, most important things to look at. So this is, these are spore prints, and this is what you do after you identify uh, using the rest of the anatomy. Uh, I just wanted to show you this real quick because it can be really fun. We like to do it for just art yeah. purposes. Um, so what you do is you take the cap of the mushroom and you put it upside down or like a spore bearing side down on either aluminum foil or glass or uh, paper that's half black and half white because as you can see there are lots of different colors of spores um many many different colors a whole rainbow of colors um and then you will leave it somewhere that it can't be disturbed by wind you will leave it overnight um sometimes you can put a couple drops of water on the cap to simulate rain and they will eject their spores in the morning you'll have this that you can look at which is helpful for identification purposes again because of the color now you can also look at these spores under a microscope. Um, that's a little bit more advanced identification, but they can still be really fun to look at. This is also a good time to look at the stipes or stems and look at their shape, um, their uh, you know rigidity or flexibility. Um, those are all very important things to be looking at. So one of the most important um, Important identification features is the spore bearing surface. What is that? Bless you. What are those? Those are gills. Those are gills. More technically called lamella, but nobody calls them that. They just call them gills. Um, this is where the spores are held and made before they're released. The um, hymenium is the spore bearing tissue of the mushroom, and it can come in gills, pores, teeth, or tubes. Um, what you will be looking for on gills is you want to see first their color. Color is very important, but do be aware that color can shift um, due to age and conditions. So it can shift a little bit um, in the same species, but color is the first thing you look for. 
Then you're going to want to look for the thickness of the gills. Are they super thin and brittle like a ruchella, or are they um, rather thick and, and very defined? Um, so you'll want to look for the thickness. Then the next is the organization. These ones are all nice and neat and straight, but you do get some that are a little bit crazy. Um, they have uh, irregular gills, or you can find some that are super compact and tight together or very wide apart. So those are very important to be looking at too. Next is the attachment to the stipe. Where is the, where, where is the attachment? Can you sit up? We can't see your face, bud. Um, right here. What is the stipe again? The stipe is the stem. 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 <laughs> so you want to look at how the gills attach to the stem. Um, for this, you're going to want to get a hand lens, um, just a little magnifying glass, because it's really important to see whether these gills are attached or detached, or if they're running all the way down the stipe, or if they have little notches or things in them. It's very important to be looking at that because those subtle little differences can sometimes mean huge differences in identification. And finally, what you want to look for in the gills are the flexibility of the gills. Some are, some will shatter really fast. Some of them you can kind of wiggle and they'll be just fine. So those are all parts of the gills that you'll want to be looking for. The next spore bearing surface we'll talk about are teeth. What's that? Those are, those are still something that holds Oh. Yep, they still hold spores. Yes, this is one of our favorite mushrooms. It is the hedgehog mushroom. Um, there aren't as many mushrooms with with teeth, so it actually um, your ID will be a little bit quicker on the mushrooms with teeth. Usually, these are very very brittle. What happens when you touch the hedges? Remember? Uh, yeah, um, they uh, they fall apart kind yeah. of. Yeah, they fall apart a little bit, but they're really fun to see um, and. They're an interesting spore structure. You still can get spore prints and such out of these, um, just like you can with the ones with the gills. Next, these are pores. And for these, um, this is a bolete mushroom. For pores, what you want to look for is, again, color. Color, very, very important. Um, and you also want to look for the size of the pores because certain species have very, very, very big pores and some have really tiny, almost, you almost can't even see them. And then you'll also want to look at the pore shape. There's some hexagonal ones, there's perfectly round ones, there's elliptical ones, um, there's all sorts of different ones. So those are all things that are going to help you identify uh, based on the spore bearing surface. But there are some exceptions to these rules, as usual. If you see on these chanterelles here, these are not actually gills. What's the difference between these and the gills? Do you remember? Um, the, the gills are like under the cap. Uh, and those are no, like not quite. Not quite. <laughs> We're a little rusty from the winter, aren't we? Um, the gills are usually very sharp for the most part. These are actually folds. They still operate similarly to gills, but these are folds rather than gills. They're very blunt um, and don't have that nice crisp edge that gills do. And that's a very important identifying feature, especially for the chanterelle, because the chanterelle is delicious. And the one with gills that looks like a chanterelle is called the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, and that one is no good to eat. So it's very, very important to get familiar with the difference between um, folds and gills and the difference in different gill formations. Um, so you still want to check their, you know, their formation and their structure, and you still want to check how they're attached to the stipe. Um, then color is also important because you can see these black trumpets also have folds, uh, but they are not chanterelles. <laughs> um, they are still delicious though. So you want to be very careful about your color identification. Again, it can get a little bit tricky because the condition of the mushroom or the condition of the environment, um, the age of the mushroom, those can all affect the color somewhat. So you want to be careful there. Um, and my advice on that is just to spend time in the woods finding these and spend time getting to know them in all their different shades and stuff. And eventually they'll start popping out to your eye a little bit better. So here is another exception to the rule. What's that? 
That's a puff ball. That's a puff ball. Puff balls are really fun. Um, there are a few puffball species that are edible, um, most puffball species, but there are a few that are very much not. We like the big giant puffballs. So if you see, this has no stipe or stem, and it has no spore-bearing surface. That's because the puffball is pretty cool. What it does is it turns its insides all into spores, and that's what happens when you touch it, and it goes, Phew. those are all the spores coming out of it. So what you want to look for in edible puffballs, this is one of the giant puffballs, uh, what you want to look for is that it is white all the way through. Then it's okay on the giant puffballs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If there's any yellowing in it, it's too old. And if you see the silhouette of a mushroom in it, that's an entirely different species and is no good to eat. Um, Either way, even if it is white all the way through, you still want to be um, identifying the species with your field guide and through experts and things like that. You still want to identify the species before you eat anything because there are always exceptions to rules um, and because it's just good practice. Hmm. It's okay to touch poisonous mushrooms, but it's not okay to eat them right yes. away because... Um, some of them, they can make you very, very sick or die. That's right. But I don't know of any mushroom you can touch that will hurt you based on your, just through your skin. Yeah. Um, just wash your hands afterwards. I mean, if you have an allergy or something, that's different. But for the most part, you're going to be safe touching mushrooms. It's okay. Just wash your hands afterwards. You're fine. Um, so this might look like an emerging puffball. It might look like a puffball. But if you slice this one, this particular one open, there's going to be a little picture of a mushroom inside of it, and those are gills that are starting to form because it is not a puffball. It is a... It is a fly agarin. It is an amanita. This one is amanita muscaria variation gesui. Um, these are the ones that we have around here. And this one is not, not good to eat unless you're a reindeer. They can eat them. <laughs> Now, this is another puffball, and as you can see, it is not white inside, is it? No, it's black it's inside. It's black inside. I mean, first of all, that just doesn't look very edible to me. I would like to try these ones for, uh, for dye, though. That might yeah. be cool. Um, so this one would not be one that you are eating because it is not white inside. So that is important. Now, this next section just kind of breaks all the rules. There are two um, main types of mushrooms based on their spore-bearing cells. There's the Basidiomycetes and the Ascomycetes. The Basidiomycetes are most of the cap and stems and the bracket mushrooms that you're gonna find. And the Ascomycetes are the cup fungi, the molds, which are also fungi, um, and these guys, which are the, you know what that one? The brain fungus. The brain fungus, Gyrometra esculenta. Um, it's also called the false morel, but it's not actually related to the morel. However, the morel is also an ascomycetes. The only difference between basidiomycetes and ascomycetes is the shape of their spore-bearing structures, which is something that you would see uh, under a microscope. The spores on these guys are carried right on the surface um, in their little folds and cups they hide in there. And they are also called the gyrometra. Yes, gyrometra esculenta. And they're good to die with. Kind of. They only made kind a beige. Of. That was kind of yeah. boring. <laughs> um, so these guys are fun because, here's another cup fungus for you. These are fun to kind of play with because if you run your finger over them, the spores will go poof. What they're waiting for is rain or an animal to walk by or something that will move them and then the spores floof out, kind of like a puffball. Um, any wind or water disturbance will make their spores fly out. Again, their spores are held right on the surface of them, so they're kind of interesting. Here is another <laughs> weird kind of identification one, and these are Romaria, but they're also coral fungi and club fungi. They don't have a cap or a stem. They are just a... They look like coral, <laughs> honestly. And so what you wanna look for on this type of mushroom, which is also a Basidiomycetes, what you wanna look on these type of mushrooms are the color. Color is very important on these ones and shouldn't vary too much except by age. And then if it's getting all yellowy and weird, you probably don't want that one. Just like you wouldn't eat like a brown and wrinkly zucchini. Same with mushrooms. If they're all bug-eaten and weird, just 
just let them there. Let the bugs eat them. Um, the next thing to look for on coral and club fungi are is the shape. Um, the shape is very important. You're going to look at the stem, or not the stem, but the, you know, the stalk thickness. Uh, some are thicker than others. Also the flexibility on these. And most importantly, you want to look at the very, very tips of each of these little branches. Because there is an edible one called the crown tip coral that has little, it looks like a little crown on top of it. Versus these guys are kind of smooth, like antler almost. So you want to pay attention to that. Um, and these... The Romaria are good for dye, but we do not eat them. Um, so that is what you want to look for in these. And the club fungi as well. The, the only difference with the club fungi and these more coral ones are the club fungi just grow uh, mostly singly. There'll be a whole bunch in one area, but they grow singly. Um, next one. And finally, for the cap and stem mushrooms, Another thing you want to look at is the margin, which is the very edge. And sometimes they can be frilly, and sometimes they're very, very clean and sharp, and then sometimes they're wavy, like this guy here. This was a fun one to find. They're um, very interesting. So the margins are very important because um, you can hit all the other identification features and think it's one thing, but then look at the margin and it'll be a little bit different. So you're not wanting to just rely on one category of identification. You want to go through um, a whole checklist. Even writing out a checklist and having like a worksheet with you is just a great idea. There's a few field guides that have things like that in them, which I think is a really good idea. You want to be checking off things that, what? <laughs> you want to be checking off things that are there rather than things that are not there. Just deal with things that you do see rather than cluttering up your mind with things that you don't see. All right, moving on to the stems or stipes. There are, again, looking for color. <laughs> color is very important. Um, the shape, whether it tapers at the top or the bottom, whether it gets wider at the bottom, um, certain ones like this Amanita here will have a bulb under the ground. So you are going to, for identification purposes, you'll want to gently dig out one specimen so that you can see the whole stipe. Um, there are a few mushroom species with this long, almost root-like looking thing on it, which are pretty cool. Um, again, you might find a bulb at the end of it. You might find it just cuts off clean there. Um, and you might even find a bug on the end of one one sort of mushroom called the cordyceps that actually grow out of bugs. So it's important to dig all the way down and see see where the very base of that stipe is. Then if you see in the middle here this um this wavy veil looking thing that actually was the veil of the mushroom as it popped up in its egg stage and this is what's left of it. It's called the annulus. Uh, it is a ring. There are a few species that that have that, and that is often a very important identification feature. So you want to be looking for a ring around the uh, around the stipe. And again, digging one out, you're going to be okay with the with the whole fungal organism. It'll regrow. Um, just don't be digging out every every single one. You only need one. Um, maybe two specimens of something to identify it properly. So um, you can be very careful with that. The next part I want to talk about is the growth formation, how they are actually coming out of the ground. Um, this, hold on, this last one, this was just a single, they're growing singly. He's growing all by himself. He doesn't have any, anybody's with him. And then this would be growing gregariously, which means there's many, 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 many in one spot, but they're not stuck together. You see, everybody has their own individual stem. So this is growing gregariously. Um, so they are separate, but they're very close together. Versus this is a cluster formation. They're all coming out of one uh, exit point from, the, um, from their substrate. And a lot of times the clusters don't have much of a stem to, to look at. Some of them don't have any at all, but some do. Um, so these are, this is the cluster formation. You can find clusters on the ground as well. Uh, so growth formation is 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 pretty important, and that's a, a pretty fast one to see too. You you know you know right away how it's growing. Yes. This is called an oyster. That is an oyster mushroom, correct? All right. So as you can see, this is also oyster, a different oyster. Um, there is not really any stem on these guys. That is not true of all clusters, but um, a lot of the cluster formation ones don't have much of a stipe to be looking at. Um, 
and things can grow singly on trees as well. This is a, uh, a bracket mushroom that is growing singly. A lot of times with the bracket mushrooms that grow singly, they're, they're a lot more sturdy and you'll be able to watch them for a long time and they'll be, they'll be around for a while. Again, this one doesn't have a stem or a stipe at all, but the spore bearing surface is all under here. You would still be able to get a, um, a spore print out of it. Although with a lot of these, there will just be spore dust underneath them. So you can look at that. Um, and again, color and, and thickness and everything is something you'll be looking at for these brackets. Um, this one is a cool one actually, because you see the different colors that gray all the way in the back is the oldest. And then the red, it was probably, um, last year, the year before his growth. And then the white growth is the new living, living growth. Uh, so you can count their age kind of like tree rings, which is neat. Um, this, what's that? That is the turkey tail. Tramedes versicolor, yes. Um, these grow in rosettes, and they also grow gregariously. What does gregariously mean? Remember? Means means they they have their own uh, spot, but they're not. But they're kind of in clusters. Yes, yeah, they're all they're all close together. Uh, turkey tails tend to grow uh, mostly in rosettes, but they also do this uh, layered thing as well. Again, you want to be looking at color, 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 look at color. However, interestingly with the turkey tail, it can range anywhere from blue to purple to brown. Um, so that's important to be looking at many different uh, images and field guides and things so you can get a feel for the range of color. Blue is the best. Yeah, for us it is because we like to die with it. <laughs> um, again, underneath here will be the spore bearing surface for the Trimedes versus color. They are pores, but there are also ones that look very, very similar that have gills, and there are also ones that have little teeth. So very, very important to be lifting up the edge of the mushroom to be looking under it, or even just take just rip one little one off so you can look at it and really get a close look with your hand lens, get really up close and personal with you with it. It's not gonna bite you. Of Here, course, because it's a mushroom. Right. <laughs> Here's another one that looks a little like the coral, but if you see really closely, again, it you might have to break out your hand lens. Is the bear is the bear fungus. Bear tooth. Bear okay. tooth. Um, you can see that it has little teeth on it. So that will differentiate it from a coral. Um, again, hand lens is your friend. You should always have a hand lens, a little magnifying glass in your foraging pack with you. Um, just even if you're not trying to eat anything, it's fun just to go out and see what's around and see the difference in everything and see just the really amazing structures that, that fungi form. They're just really incredible, like architectural marbles. They're really neat. Um, so, it is okay to get up close and personal with your fungi friends. They will not hurt you that way. Now here is a pretty famous one, um, and it's kind of one of our pet causes. What is that? Chaga. Chaga. Chaga is very popular, and its medicinal value is, is pretty incredible. But there are other annually fruiting fungi that do a lot of the things that chaga does. So chaga we want to use carefully because it... Um, this is not actually a mushroom. This is part of the mycelium. It's called a mycelial sclerotia. It's a hard bit of mycelium. So this isn't releasing spores to reproduce. As a matter of fact, the, fun, or the chaga, when it fruits, it, it's pretty rare. It's pretty exciting for mycologists to be able to witness that because it doesn't happen very often. They don't reproduce that often and they're very slow growing. So we wanna be careful when we're harvesting things like chaga. It's okay to take a little bit of this one. It will grow back. Um, just not taking the whole thing and digging it out of the tree. That's no good. I always get nervous when I see people having like, 50 or 25 pounds of chaga for sale. That's just not, that's just not sustainable. Um, so if you come across this one, if you are not in dire need of it, just let him grow. Um, but if you would like to use a little bit, it's okay to take a little bit um, of this blackish stuff with you for medicine and to look at it at home. Um, they are quite forgiving. <laughs> They'll be all right. All right. So to review for you, this is the order that we should go in when we're identifying things. First is time of year. Uh, all mushrooms have their season. So if you're finding something that looks like a morel in, you know, late summer, 
mm, probably double check your ID on that because they don't grow then. So it's very important to be, um, to become familiar with the life cycle of the mushrooms as well and the life cycle of an individual species. So after the time of year, we're going to want to look at the growing medium. Are they growing on the ground? Are they growing in trees? Sometimes on the ground ones, you're going to want to dig under a little bit because there might be a buried piece of old wood or something there. Um, so you want to take very careful stock of the growing substrate, what they are growing on. The next is going to be the growth pattern. Again, that's you know cluster formation or growing singly or growing gregariously. Um, Take a look at that. And those are all things you can tell right like that. So that's as long as you have um, a few species in your mind that you know for sure, you can build your vocabulary, vocabulary over time. Next would be the color. So again, what changes color? What can make it the color uh, weird? It can in, in the time of year. Oh, yeah. Uh, the photo period is important. The um, How much water is around will change the color. And again, the age of the mushroom can change the color as well. Um, next, you will want to look at the spore bearing structure, gills, teeth, pores, what have you. That will be the next thing you look at. Then you're going to look at the stipe shape. Um, check whether it has the annulus, that ring around it, check whether it has a bulb or a bug at the end of it. Um, and then finally, after you've worked with all that, then you can go to the spore print. No, nope, spore print. Then you can bring the, uh, the mushroom home and do a spore print with it um, to either solidify your ID or maybe give you another hint. And if after all of that, you still don't know what it is, then it's time to get an expert in. And then it's time to, you know, take it into a local college or something. Um, you can usually call them up and see if they have an expert around. Um, uh, historical centers, nature centers, things like that will usually have somebody that can help you out. There are mycologists out there and they all really love to talk about mushrooms all the time. So <laughs> they, you, will, you will not make any experts mad by asking, you know, the simplest of questions over and over again, because that helps us cover our basics too. And that helps us review as well. She's a mycologist. Well, I'm not bigger, but <laughs> I'm an amateur mycologist. All right. So that is my overview for you. I'll stop sharing.